Yeah, you know, it, it was beyond repugnant, Ashley, because not only did it not have any basis in law for somebody to make that motion, but it really stands in contrast to everything our judicial system strives to be in fairness and in openness to people of all origins, people of all races. And we fail sometimes, but that's what we strive to be. But one of the other things that I think is particularly troubling about this to make it beyond repugnant is it's so incendiary. It really puts, having been through a high profile trial where people make threats, threats to the courthouse, et cetera, et cetera, and nothing that I would ever endorse, of course, but this brings these things forward. This gins up the public and makes the safety of everyone around him puts, puts that in higher jeopardy. And I think that's why we saw one of his colleagues come out right away stand in front of the courthouse and unabashedly and correctly so say that those comments were asinine because he needed to turn down the temperature and focus on the trial. The attorney for Mr. McMichael is focused on the trial, and it seems that Mr. Goff might have his focus elsewhere in the gallery where the trial does not play out. And, you know, I almost wanted to ask Julia, and I just ran out of time to do it. I noticed that with Jason, when he was out there making the statement that it was asinine, there was a lot of noise in the background that sounded like peaceful, albeit, but protesters and a lot of loud voices, and we don't always hear that. So you do wonder if that did get people going because they knew this comment had been made. Kirk, let's listen together because the piece of sound that Julia Janae referenced about the comment of the pastor in the courtroom we now have available. Governor, I was reminded of one matter that I wanted to address. My understanding, while I was cross-examining Investigator Lowry yesterday, is that the right Reverend Al Sharpton managed to find his way into the back of the courtroom. I'm guessing he was somehow there at the invitation of the victim's family in this case. And I have nothing personally against Mr. Sharpton. My concern is that it's one thing for the family to be present. It's another thing to ask for the lawyers to be present. But if we're going to start a precedent starting yesterday, we're going to bring high profile members of the African-American community into the courtroom to sit with the family during the trial in the presence of the jury. I believe that's intimidating and it's an attempt to pressure, could be consciously or unconsciously, an attempt to, to pressure or influence the jury. All right, Kirk, I have to ask, I know we've talked about the insensitivity of what he said, and, and the attorney called it probably appropriately, in your opinion, asinine. What about this piece of the argument that it could, even if not intentionally, intimidate the jury? It's, it's just nonsense. I mean, again, there's no legal basis for it. There's no factual basis for it. It's just utter and complete nonsense, and it just... If, Fortunately for his client, this wasn't done in front of the jury because if the jury heard any of this, they would probably disregard anything that Mr. Goff says. I heard a few more things along that line during his cross-examination uh, this afternoon that might not serve his client very well. But again, there's no basis for it, completely insensitive and completely against everything the American judicial system strives to stand for. Yeah, and I think certainly that it is making the rounds in terms of people are talking about it because people tend to agree, our viewers that I like to follow on social media are agreeing with you and in the inappropriateness and the fact that he even thought to say this in a courtroom. All right, so we are going to take a break. I know you're going to stay with us, Kirk. When we come back, we are going to shift gears because we do want to talk about the case in Wisconsin against Kyle Rittenhouse, another divisive case. We'll cover that when we come back here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. The word victim is a loaded, loaded word. And I think alleged victim is a cousin to it. You're carrying it concealed, are you not? That is correct. It's unlawful for you to carry it concealed. Is that not true? Unlawful? <laughs> there were three people right there. <laughs> this would be brought out. I, I was a astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. Is that video edited? Uh, no, I have not edited it, but it has been put together at the right time, the timing. Who did that? I did that.
Those are some of the biggest moments. In the case that we've been following here live on Court TV, Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse, another divisive case, divisive trial. This is a case in which there are four people were shot at by Kyle Rittenhouse, two of them deceased, the other injured. Now, the latest is today the judge did not have the jury come to the courthouse because he went through jury instructions with the attorneys. The biggest news coming out of that, the lesser included are going to be included as offenses that the jury considers against this defendant. Now, on Monday, we expect closing arguments to begin. The jury is supposed to come back Monday morning. And the judge, after different legal arguments and decisions to be made, decided each side will have two and a half hours for their closing arguments on Monday. Our own Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter is in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and has more on this story. Chanley? Fireworks inside the courtroom earlier for the jury charge conference and prosecutors scored a rare win before Judge Bruce Schrader. Uh, Thomas Binger actually argued for a provocation instruction to be included so that the jury could consider whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse was the initial aggressor in the shootings of August 25th, 2020. The instruction provides that if a person provokes an attack, there is no privilege of self-defense. The state claims that this drone video shows Kyle pointing his rifle in the Carcelers parking lot before Joseph Rosenbaum starts to chase him, something the defense disputes. You know, we had all these little things going on yesterday and I went back to my office and the whole essence of the problem came down to these two facts in the testimony. Examiner Armstrong took 20 hours to manipulate that photograph to get that blurry mess up on the screen. We had our expert do it right in front of the jury in seconds, and it showed what it was. And that's where the hocus pocus and adding the pixels and all the other garbage comes in, and that's what they're building their prosecution on. What I made a determination was that I thought the jury should make the decision. And that's all we're asking. Um, so that's your best picture, the one I saw over there? No. Just set up Where's one. the best picture, please? This jury will also be able to consider some lesser included offenses in the shootings of Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz. Kyle, who faces six counts, was questioned by the judge today about the possibility of the lesser included charges. If the jury finds that none of the crimes charged in the sequence, charged or submitted has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, then they must acquit you, they must find you not guilty. And they cannot convict you of more than one crime on each count. Okay? Yes, Your Honor. The jurors are back inside this courthouse on Monday for the all-important closing arguments. Each side has two and a half hours before. The jury of 18 is whittled down to only 12. And remember, Kyle could spend the rest of his life behind bars if convicted of the top count. Reporting in downtown Kenosha, I'm Chanley Painter with Court TV. All right, thank you so much to Chanley Painter. We also want to discuss another development in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. The defendant's mother, Wendy Rittenhouse, who you've seen in the back of the courtroom, spoke to Fox News last night. Both she and Kyle broke down when he took the stand on Wednesday, and it seems like everyone had an opinion about it. Some say the moment was an emotional win for the defense, yet others believe the tears were not genuine. Ms. Rittenhouse says she couldn't help herself. I just broke down with with Kyle crying like that. It made me feel heartbroken, sad, and I wanted to just go up there and just hug him and tell him it would be okay. She was also asked about Drud Judge Schrader, who some are accusing of showing bias in favor of the defendant. Wendy Rittenhouse praised him for being even-handed. Do you think your son has received a fair trial? The judge is very fair. Um, people that I talked to that lives in Kenosha all their lives, they told me that Judge Schroeder is a very fair judge and he doesn't allow no nonsense in his courtroom.
All right, still with us, former criminal defense attorney Kirk Nurmi. Kirk, one of the things that I really want to talk about is the addition of the provocation instruction to the jury because I've read the statute. I'm such a trial nerd. I printed it out. I highlighted it. And here's the reality, that if this jury finds that Kyle Rittenhouse provoked, then he may not even be able to claim self-defense. That's a pretty major development in terms of what this jury might find. You bet, Judge, because ultimately it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the about what really happened here, the grandiose comments, everything else. This is the great avenue for the state to make their closing, to center their closing around. Because I think most people can agree, most rational people can agree, even though this case is divisive, that Kyle Rittenhouse was not equipped to be where he was at or to do what he was doing. I mean, starting off with the count about how, possessing a gun, I believe that's count six, possessing a gun being under age, 18, there's a reason we have that. And there's a reason he shouldn't have been there because something like this could happen, because he could provoke this sort of behavior. And that is the avenue that the state should drive home during their closing argument, because it's reasonable, it's not divisive, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, common sense sometimes isn't so common, but if they went down that road, I think they'd have a lot more success in terms of obtaining a conviction. All right, so I must ask you this. We all know that opening statements are where you say this is what we expect the evidence will be or evidence will show. Closing is when you get to say, here are all the facts, you've heard all the evidence, and here's my theory of what those facts mean and why you should convict or not the defendant, depending on your side. Do you believe, Kirk, that really juries can be won or lost by closing arguments in terms of the decision that they're going to reach? I certainly think they can. I mean, sometimes in opening statements, like I've said earlier in this case, promises can be made, right? And they not not kept, and then the jury can hold that against it. But at the same time, when we have a trial with so much evidence, video evidence, that seems to be the most powerful evidence that the jury's going to see. And then to be able to argue off of that, to be able to argue off the tragedy of it all, to be able to argue consistent with the jury instructions, remember, because this is what they're going to have back. So there's going to be that correlation that when they jury has those jury instructions saying, okay, this tracks with what the state was saying or what the defense was saying, then that can be used between jurors who are making arguments one way or the other can be kind of the referee in the jury room and kind of guide the jurors in their deliberation towards whether they're going to check guilty or not guilty for the whether it's the primary offense or a lesser included. And you know, you mentioned all of those, I have to say, Kirk, the um, videos, the audios, I know the state said, here judge, we need two and a half hours because we're going to use those in our closing, the exhibits, the videos, the pictures. And I think that's one of the most effective ways to really persuade a jury that your theory of the case is right. Kirk, you're going to stay with us. We are going to take a break. When we come back, you do not want to miss our special segment, Exhibits Marked, about evidence presented in the Rittenhouse case. That's here up next. Breaking news here on Court TV. We want to bring you the latest regarding Britney Spears. Very big news. The conservatorship has been dissolved. Britney Spears is free. A judge in Los Angeles has just ended that conservatorship that has controlled her life and her money, $50 million, for the past 13 years. Spears' father was removed from the conservatorship, and now she will be free to make her own medical, financial, and personal decisions for the first time since 2008. Keep in mind that Free Britney was a movement that started because she didn't get to make decisions, including things like buying a cup of coffee and what color she could paint her stairs, including uh, her sons and visitation being supervised. So certainly want to bring you that news here first on Court TV.
now turning our attention back to Wisconsin where Kyle Rittenhouse is on trial for shooting three men and killing two of them during the Kenosha protest in August of 2020. We are waiting for closing arguments to begin in this case on Monday. And in the meantime, want to turn our attention to the evidence. With so many opinions on what happened that evening, the case certainly will come down to the evidence presented in court. So let's talk about some of the more important evidence admitted in this trial in our exhibits marked segment. Still with us, former criminal defense attorney who represented Jody Arias, Kirk Nurmi. Kirk, let's talk first and foremost about the video drone footage because not only was there video drone footage, also the subject of the debate and many arguments before the court is the reality of a picture with the defendant in that picture with a gun. How significant is that piece of evidence in and of itself? Well, you know, no, no piece of evidence really exists in and of itself. They're all tied together, right? There's a string, a theme that ties them all together. But every single image, I think, that shows Kyle Rittenhouse with that lethal weapon in his hand, with that AR-15 in his hand, is not good for the defense. It shows that he was capable of doing, I always consider this a weapon of mass destruction, right? This is capable of hurting a lot of people. That's the weapon he chose to bring, the strap, the scope, everything. Anything that connects him to that gun is never going to be good for the defense. Okay, so let's start with that premise, because you're right. They have to look at the evidence in its entirety. So I think you just said, never going to be good for the defense. So we can look at that video drone or drone video footage and say, that might be a check for the prosecution. So let's pivot and talk now about the fact that they have evidence of a skateboard attack of the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. And I think we have some pictures of that to show where we know there is the skateboard being used to hit Kyle. What's your assessment of that piece of evidence if it were to be freestanding? Right. Freestanding alone, certainly it's not good for the prosecution because we see Mr. Rittenhouse being attacked by someone with a skateboard, right? And his, you know, was is that capable of lethal force? I don't know. They certainly tried to make it seem that way. So, yeah, this is obviously something that helps the defense, showing him as attacked. But, you know, there's a flip side to that, the idea that you have someone walking around with this weapon. How would people respond, given the amount of mass shootings we've seen in this country? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a really important piece of this, and a lot of viewers have said this, listen, what is he doing there with this weapon, similar to an AR-15? Why does he have it in the first place? Why did he take it upon himself to go to this area with this kind of gun? Of course, something bad can happen. It was really too much force. It wasn't reasonable, even though he was being hit by the skateboard. But on the other hand, in the, the moments, those few moments, you have to think about, is it reasonable in his mind that he was going to be attacked, gun taken away, him killed, and that therefore it was a reasonable use of force? I don't know the answer to that. The jury has to decide. But I'm keeping a list. So I would say basically that was a checkmark for the defense because you pointed out he is, in fact, getting hit by a skateboard. All right, let's look at another important piece of evidence that came into this trial that's been admitted that the jury has listened to, will consider, and that's Kyle Rittenhouse himself saying, we are running medical, I'm from the area. He even at one point in time said, oh, I'm EMS, and he admits on the stand, I lied, I said that. He would never say he lied, but he did admit he said that even though it wasn't true. What does that do to his credibility and what the jury might take away from that, Kirk? I think that's a huge point for the state because he is misrepresenting himself. And it goes to a theme that the state could possibly argue that, you know, that we've been talking about, that he inserted himself in somewhere that he wasn't capable of handling, in a situation he wasn't capable of handling. That's why, again, going back to the gun, he wasn't old enough to possess that gun. And he's lying about his coffee. He's trying to be bigger than he is. He's trying to be bigger and badder than he is. And that is such a good point of argument for the state to make in their prosecution. So it's a huge check mark, Ashley, for the state. I agree. And I also think, Kirk, that it really goes to the importance of the state putting together a good closing argument with the lesser included, because it may mean that the jury, if they don't convict on some of those first counts, 
but want to hold him accountable. They may feel like the facts and the law go together for the lesser included. I think it's really significant that those lesser included will be presented to the jury. All right, next. So I have two prosecution, one defense. Let's talk about another piece of evidence. And this is the victim, Grosskreutz, who we know survived, pointing a gun as he gets shot. What does that do for us? Well, it's certainly not good because for the state, it gives uh, Mr. Rittenhouse and his lawyers a chance as it relates to this specific count, uh, the assault account, to argue that he felt like his life was in jeopardy and maybe even gives them reason, further reason to make that argument as it relates to Mr. Huber as well, because this was all in the same point in time. It is reasonable then, with these two images we're seeing related to Mr. Huber and Mr. Grosskoit, that it, it was reasonable for Mr. Rittenhouse to be in fear, and therefore his actions were legally justified. So that's a, a huge check mark for the defense. All right, so we basically, in those four pieces of evidence that we know this jury will have to consider, two for pro-state, to pro-defense, in your opinion, and I think that it always reminds me, I have great trust in our jury system, and do they always get it right? No, but when the rules of law are followed and the facts are presented for their consideration, they take this job very seriously, and I think this jury is really going to have to sift through all of these different pieces of evidence to conclude what they think based on the facts presented. If you had a crystal ball, knowing what you know about all of the evidence presented, Presented, Kirk, how long do you expect it may take this jury to deliberate? Don't Boy, you hate questions gonna... like that? I'm sorry, uh, go ahead and answer. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm bound to be wrong, right? <laughs> but you know what? It, it's going to be one of those issues where I think the truth lies in the middle. And you you acutely put out the idea that, you know, these, these lesser included instructions are so important because I think a lot of jurors are going to say that the two extremes that the state has presented, that the defense has presented, probably aren't accurate reflections of what they see in the video. So that's going to create a lot of discussion. And you know, there are studies around videos. People are going to see different things in videos. So when they go back there and they look at these videos, they discuss these videos, what they saw, everything else, fitting that into the box of a particular crime, whether it's a primary or lesser included, is going to take some time. It's going to take some compromise. It's going to take some discussion. So I don't think this is going to be a quick verdict. Right. Yep. We're going to wait and see. I really appreciate your expertise as we talk about exhibits marked because that's what the jury is going to be talking about once this case goes to them for deliberation. Stay with Court TV. We're going to continue to update you on the Rittenhouse and Arbery cases. But next, near and dear to my heart, we are going to focus on the youngest victims. We'll talk about why the family of Janelle Matthews may have to wait even longer before getting justice for her kidnapping and murder. Janelle was an outspoken, vivacious 12-year-old middle schooler, excited about Christmas break. She was a tween, as we say nowadays, playing sports, involved in her church, doing really well in school, and someone that loved hanging out with her friends. It's now time to shine a light on the youngest victims. The prosecutors in Colorado say they will again attempt to have Steve Pankey convicted for the kidnapping and murder of Janelle Matthews after a jury was unable to reach a verdict on three of the four charges against him. Now, Janelle was only 12 years old when she disappeared, get this, in 1984, but her body was not found until a few years ago in July of 2019, decades later in an oil field. Court TV brought our viewers testimony in that case, and last week a jury found that Steve Pankey's obsessive interest in Janelle did not make him a killer. He was only found guilty of false reporting to authorities. We, the jury, find the defendant, Stephen Dana Pankey, guilty of false reporting to authorities. Is this your verdict? So say you and so say each and every one of you. And getting yes. Counsel, you wish me to pull the jury? No. Thank, Thank you. you. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, realize uh, the jury was unable to reach a verdict on the other counts, and that is a perfectly acceptable way for a trial to conclude. 
Steve Pankey has not been sentenced yet on the false reporting conviction, but he does have a hearing scheduled for next Wednesday to discuss the possibility of a new trial. I want to bring back in now, we still have with us Kirk Nurmi. Can't wait to talk to you about this case. But first, what I want to do is take a look back at how we got here. Our affiliate KMGH has more on the disturbing details in the death of Janelle Matthews. At first, the family of Janelle Matthews prayed for her safe return. It was always like a cold case. And sometimes I'd go to Walmart and I would see the age progression photos and that would kind of like uh, startle you a little bit. When it became clear that wouldn't happen, they prayed for answers. I trust this new development helps the Matthews family, their friends, and our community to receive some closure and healing from this horrific crime. Greeley police and prosecutors announced the arrest of Steve Pankey on charges of first-degree murder. Police believe he kidnapped Matthews from her home, shot her in the head, and dumped her body in rural Weld County. The discovery of Janelle's remains were significant in the course of this investigation, obviously, but also in um, leading us in part back to a, a suspect. In 1984, Panky lived just a few miles from the Matthews home. He would later move to Idaho and unsuccessfully run for governor. Rather than lie low, prosecutors say he would often insert himself into the investigation. There are a number of statements that he has made over the course of time. Uh, both to courts, to law enforcement, to in unsolicited letters in which he indicates some very intimate knowledge about um, the commission of the crime, information that uh, the general public and the media was not privy to. In 2013, he sent a document to law enforcement about a family trip that was meant to serve as an alibi in Janelle's disappearance. If anything, it only made police more suspicious. Panky's wife would remember her husband digging in the yard. Two days later, their car exploded. Panky promptly sent it to a salvage yard. It's really a matter of these detectives taking all of that information, putting it together, and, and really doing the, the follow-up investigation that needed to be done. All right, Kirk, of course we're watching this right after I talk about the fact I trust in our jury system. A hung jury happens. Clearly that was their decision based on the evidence. But let's start at the beginning of this story. Yes, it was in 1984, a cold case that they hadn't solved. They had interviewed Stephen Pankey in this case, but she was 12. She dis disappeared from the home. There was testimony of her father coming home. She wasn't there. She was found in 2019, shot in her head. The thing that frustrates me as a child advocate for the state of Georgia in cases like this, somebody knows what happened. 12, shot in the head, kidnapped. Somebody knows exactly who did this to this girl. Well, there's no doubt about it, but you're right. 1984. Think about how tough it would be for the prosecutor to go forward. And, you know, somebody might know about it, but that somebody may no longer be alive. So with a case like this, we have to give, you know, the state a little leeway and the jury a little leeway. As much as we might want to see justice, we want to make sure that justice is the right kind of justice and the right person is convicted. And so a case from 1984, it doesn't surprise me that the jury might have trouble making that leap that the state made. Especially because, you're right, almost 40 years later, the evidence that is going to be presented is going to be much different, I would suggest, than evidence you might hear in a current case, right? Because all of the detective, the interviewing, the style, the techniques, the technology, all of those things in 40 years, there can be a lot of changes. You're right. I mean, DNA, investigative techniques, all those sort of things you know, eyewitness testimony, all those sort of things. There's no possibility of really retaining that, as you said, almost 40 years later. And it makes it very, very tough. And, you know, ultimately the state's theory in this case seems to be he was acting strange. He was inserting himself into the investigation, which I grant you is suspicious. But is that enough to prove murder? I don't know. The jury, obviously, in this case, didn't say so, at least not this time. All right. And we're going to listen in just a minute, but I don't want to listen yet to a little bit of the testimony because I have to tell you one other thing and see if it makes a difference to you. His lawyer has stepped down and now he's been appointed a public defender. But, you know, of course, there are all kinds of reasons we stop representing someone. But what do you think about after the jury comes back, his lawyer steps aside? 
Well, you know, his lawyer could be going through all kinds of personal things behind the scenes, things we don't know about. I think the motion said something, the effect that he was no longer able to provide him with effective assistance of counsel, didn't have the energy to go forward, something like that. To me, that concerns me that this attorney is maybe going through some personal or health struggles, or maybe a family member is, and he is rightly making the choice to to step away and allow someone else to defend uh, his former client. Yeah, lots of reasons it can happen. All right, let's listen together to that testimony. Now, this is the ex-wife of Steve, the defendant, testifying about some of his suspicious activities at the time. Mark brought the urine in and he set it on a high counter between the kitchen and the living room. And I was, I mean, we were all there kind of grouped in twos talking to each other, like Esther was talking to Steve's sister, Terry, kind of right here. And I mean, it was kind of like pockets of people. So I was telling my sister, I said, we were at this high bar counter standing there looking at it. And I said, there's going to be a photo plaque of the last photo that I took of Carl um, right here. Mm -hmm. And Steve stepped up between Vanessa and I and was obviously very choked up. It's the only time I ever saw that much emotion from him. But very choked up, he bent and he kissed the urn. And he said, I hope God didn't allow this to happen because of Janelle Matthews. All right, Kirk, so suspicious with? activity behaviors may not have been enough for this jury to convict, but now the state is reassessing and expects to charge him again, and I think that that gives them the opportunity to really hone the details of the case, or rather presentation of this case, to present it a little differently. You bet, and one thing, retrials are always something that the prosecution has more success with. I use the baseball analogy, you know, the defense, when they're in this case, throws their best pitch. And now the state knows it's coming. So either they got to throw their second best pitch in a second trial, or they got to throw the same pitch and the state knows it's coming. So it makes it a lot harder for the, for the defense to succeed in getting a hung jury at this second trial. And I really believe in cold cases. I've worked cold cases for a very long time in lots of different capacities. And, Kirk, I truly believe that eventually we learn more. Eventually bodies are found. Eventually something comes forward. So I have to believe in my heart that things happen eventually to help solve these cold cases. But what last thoughts might you have about these cold cases, especially when it comes to children? You know, I just applaud the work of the prosecutors and the police that keep these cases alive because, you know, no matter how old they are, those families deserve justice. There's always a sense of loss. I've done cold cases and they're under horrific circumstances, you know, horrific ver uh, uh, killings. And justice really needs to be found one way or the other, regardless of time. Time does not um, mitigate the need for justice. All right. Kirk Nurmi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Greatly appreciate your expertise. Finally, it's time to take action. Janelle Matthews was just a 12-year-old kid in a quiet Colorado neighborhood. So we want to take this opportunity to draw your attention to two more girls who have gone missing in the state of Colorado in just the last 30 days. First, 15-year-old Janessa DeBell from Golden, Colorado. She disappeared on October 25th. Janessa is Hispanic with brown hair and eyes. She stands 5 foot 2 inches tall and 120 pounds. All right, up next, Michael Ayala in the anchor seat, bringing you more from all the day's live coverage here on Court TV.